Resurrection Day. I don't know if you celebrated that here or if you were traveling with family or what you were doing, but uh, Easter Sunday is always just great, uh, and, and there are lots of reasons for that. Um, more people. Last week we had 394 people worship here, so that was really cool. Um, and because of that, sometimes it just seems like there's, there's more energy in the air or something like that. And, and sometimes it's kind of hard to explain. I was talking with a group of other ministers about Easter. Uh, many churches feel the need like to go big on Easter Sunday. And uh, you may have seen some of, of that happen before. You know, churches might pull out all the stops and do something real cool on Easter Sunday morning. Um, I know some that will drop Easter eggs from a helicopter. That's really cool. So that's my vote next year. We're going to do that. Um, some have special theatrics of some kind. I actually watched a video this last week. Um, th this church building was had a huge auditorium, really tall like ours. Uh, without these lights in the middle, and they had a balcony, and so their preacher ziplined from the balcony to the front of the stage to start his sermon. It's not happening for lots of different reasons. Uh, those theatrics, those big moments on Easter, they're, they're cool. You know, there's nothing wrong with them. But for, for some reason, part of me wonders if we do a disservice to the resurrection of Christ when we have those big theatrical moments because it's almost as if we're saying that the resurrection is the end of his story. But it's just not. And the resurrection is cool, don't get me wrong. Like Because of the resurrection of Christ, we have power over death. We have assurance that the salvation that we share in Jesus Christ is a for sure thing. We, we know that the resurrection conquers a lot of things and allows the kingdom of God to be victorious. But it's not, it's not the end all. Because if you've been reading his story, you know that there's stuff that happens after the resurrection. And in some ways, the resurrection of Christ is actually a beginning to a lot of other things that happen. As a church, we've been going through this book called His Story. And uh, it's 14 chapters long. We did the 14th chapter this week, which is what I'm preaching from today. And uh, I want to see a show of hands. Who read every chapter of His Story throughout this time? Look at you, overachievers. So proud of you. No, you're my peeps. I appreciate that. That's cool stuff. Lots of people reading through this and uh, some cool feedback, you know, just about getting to kind of know the story of Jesus a little bit more accurately. And that's, that's good stuff. That's exactly what we hope to accomplish through this. Um, today, I'd like to kick things off in John chapter 21. John chapter 21, starting at verse 1. So this is after the resurrection. This is the rest of or the beginning of the rest of his story. John 21 verse 1 says this, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, which is just another name for the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. So do some quick math here real quick. And how many disciples were together that day? Oh, Titus. Oh, Titus. He names five. I'm just so, so surprised by that kid. He never gets it wrong. Uh, five, five names and then two more that aren't named. So seven. And out of the total number of apostles, there are 11 at this time. Because remember, Judas Iscariot has now died. And there are 11 apostles. And seven of those 11 are here on the Sea of Tiberias slash Sea of Galilee this day. And uh, verse 3 says this, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. And so why do they do this? Well, Peter and some of the other guys were professional fishermen. This is what they were used to. This is their comfort area. And so Peter thought, well, we don't really know what else to do, so I'm going to go out and fish today. Maybe make a little money. Maybe keep myself busy so I don't think about all the stuff that just happened, right? And the rest of these guys said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Pause for a second. There's like one thing worse than having a terrible fishing experience. You know what it is? What's that? No such thing, Caleb says. Well, you're wrong. 
Because you can have a really bad fishing experience, but the only thing worse is what Jesus does to these guys after their really bad fishing experience, which is funny. Check out what Jesus does. Verse 4, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. So in a few seconds, we'll find out that he's about 100 yards, or they are about 100 yards offshore. Jesus is this stranger on the shore. They can't really tell who it is from where they're at on the boat. And so he shows up, and he calls out to them. Verse 5, friends, haven't you any fish? The only thing worse than a bad fishing experience is someone saying, so how'd you do, right? And so that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He knows that they haven't caught anything, and he's like rubbing it in, a little salt in the open wound. Don't you have any fish? No, they answered. So he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. You realize what this is? It's like deja vu, one of those experiences. Because do you remember what happened early on in his story? The, 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 the chapter in which Jesus calls his apostles, what were they doing that day? They were fishing. And they had been out all night and they had caught how many fish? None. And Jesus shows up and he's like, have you tried the other side of the boat? And they're like, whatever. So they throw in their nets and they get this huge catch of fish And these guys are experiencing the same exact thing, and it clicks. Verse 7, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's a kind of a nickname for John. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, said to Peter, it's Jesus, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, it kind of clicked in his mind too. He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off to fish, and he jumped into the water. Now the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the fish or the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. Peter just can't wait to go talk to Jesus who is on shore. Now what happens is they have his little breakfast together. Jesus says, take some of your fish, let's cook it up. He's got a fire going. They cook some fish, they eat it for breakfast, and uh, then the conversation gets real serious. Skip down to verse 18. Jesus is speaking to Peter and he says, I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Now to me, it sounds like Jesus is talking about like the nursing home. You've seen it. People who have been healthy and fine and dandy, they've dressed themselves their whole lives. They've fed themselves their whole lives. They've been mobile on their own their whole lives, and they go to the nursing home, and things change. Health deteriorates. People have to dress them. People have to feed them. People have to take them places. And it's almost like Jesus is saying, you're going to get old one day, and you're not going to be able to take care of yourself. That's actually not at all what Jesus is saying. Look at verse 19. Jesus told Peter this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. In other words, Jesus is saying, Peter, do you remember how I just died? You remember how I was led off as a sheep to slaughter and I had no choice? Well, I did, but in essence, I had no choice. I I had to follow through with that death. They crucified me against my will in some way or another, right? They led me off to death. Peter, you're going to experience the same exact thing. You remember how history books say Peter dies? Crucifixion. And and so Jesus is telling Peter, your death is going to be miserable just like mine was. And then Jesus says, so follow me. Yikes. Now, instead of getting all hung up on that, I want you to see Verse 20, as Peter is processing this information, verse 20 says this, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. In other words, Jesus and Peter are walking along having this conversation and John is hanging out in the background listening to what's going on. And Peter turns around, he sees John there and so this is what he says. Peter saw John and he looks at Jesus and he says, Lord, what about, what about him? What, am I about, what about my buddy John? What's going to happen to him? And it's almost as if, you know, Peter's just concerned about his friend, hoping that maybe he won't have to suffer a horrible death. 
But really, verse 22, Jesus' response to this kind of puts it in context of exactly what's going on in Peter's mind. Jesus answers, he says, if I want him, if I want John to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because what Peter is doing here is that age-old, relationship-ruining, joy-stealing thing that you and I call comparison. To get started this morning, here's, here's what I want you to think about, this whole comparison thing. It's normal to compare ourselves to others. Will you say that with me? It's normal to compare ourselves to others. We gauge our success or lack thereof by looking at the outward appearance of others. We do this as far as health is concerned, right? We like, do I look as good as they do, right? Do my clothes fit as nicely as theirs fit? What's my hair like today? You guys like that? I got it cut right here in town, actually. So we do this about our physical looks, we do that about our weight, our fitness, our athletic abilities, our academic achievements, our uh, work ethic. We like to look around and see if people work as hard as we do, and if, if they don't, we're like, yeah, and if they do, we're like, we better step it up and that, right? As we get a little bit older, we want to see, uh, relatively speaking, if we make about the same amount of money that our counterparts do, you know, we want to see, we want to just balance it out to make sure it's even, and so we begin comparing ourselves to others, but we don't just do this about uh, money or fitness or health. We do this about spiritual stuff too. I'd be lying to you today and you would be lying to me if any of us in here would just say, well, I've never done that before. Let's be honest. We look around at each other and gauge our church attendance. Am I doing better than they are? When we're in small group settings or maybe even at church and you see people flipping through their Bible and they know where books of the Bible are and you don't, you're like, oh, dude, maybe I should step it up and out. And those of us who do know where the verses are, we're like, yeah, boy, look at me. I'll flip right to those pages in two tries. We compare all the time about spiritual things, how we pray or how well we don't in public. We, we do this all the time as far as comparison is concerned. And truth is, most of us would really like to know how much the other one is putting in the offering plate. Wouldn't we? Hmm. So let me repeat that again. It's normal co to compare ourselves to others. But just because something is normal doesn't mean it's helpful. And so a uh, quick side note here, during World War II, in the, in the 40s, the United States Navy wanted to build, well first design and build, the world's best uh, battleship, basically. It wasn't necessarily a battleship that would like shoot things, it would be a troop carrier. And so the United States Navy partnered with this company called the U.S. Lines who built ships and operated ships. And they got together and they uh, designed this puppy called the SS United States. Anybody ever seen this thing up close? Um, it's actually in Philadelphia now. You can go see it. Pause for a second. But in the 40s, they wanted to design the best, fastest troop ship they could imagine because uh, most of the good troop ships around the world were built in Great Britain, and we wanted to one-up those guys, right? Freedom! So they designed this thing. And uh, because the war ended before it was finished, they thought, well, we got to do something else with it. We were there in the middle of buying or building it, and it cost $79.4 million in the 40s and 50s, which today would be like $650 million. And if they didn't do something with this puppy midstream, then you guarantee there'd be a whole nation of people saying, What'd you do with our money? And so they thought, Let's turn this thing into a cruise ship. So that's what they did. The ship that could originally hold 15,000 troops to go to battle kind of turned itself around and made itself a cruise ship that would host the world's wealthiest and most popular people which were the only ones who could really afford a ticket for that baby. And so it would make trips across the Atlantic Ocean time and time again. For 18 years, that's what it did. But when the 60s rolled around, especially the end of the 60s, air travel was the way to go. Right? You could get there so much faster and cheaper in the long run, and so people began using airfare instead of purchasing tickets for this transatlantic ship. And so guess what this thing did? 
nothing. They took it to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which is where it still stands, and this is kind of what it looks like today. You can't really tell, but it's not so pretty anymore. In fact, they've had crews come in and salvage certain parts off of it. They had to rip all the asbestos out of it, of course, and it left the interior just in ruins. The exterior doesn't look so great itself. And over the years, people have thought, well, what are we going to do with this thing? This is our flagship. As far as shipbuilding is concerned, this is what the United States is supposed to be recognized by. And it's sitting there in Philadelphia just wasting away, and it just looks awful. People have thought, let's turn it into a hotel on the water. It didn't work. Let's turn it into a casino. It didn't work. Let's turn it into a water park. Still not working. And so this ship just sits there wasting away away. Why? Comparison. More than once in the history of this ship, its owners and operators looked around. They thought cruise ship. No, didn't work. They, shot, they thought, thought entertainment. Didn't work. Floating casino. Didn't work. Luxury. Comfort. All those things just left in ruins. See, when Peter looks at John and says, Jesus, what about him? He's thinking the same thing that many of us have thought time and time again, which is this. Well, compared to him, compared to her, I'm not doing so bad. And every time we begin comparing ourselves to others, especially in spiritual things, I think behind those comparisons is this nagging question. When we compare ourselves to others, we mask This really big question that just picks away at all of us inside, and that is this. Will Jesus really accept me? You see, when the roll is called up yonder, we sing that song, When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. But many many of us were wanting to know, will I really be there? Will Jesus really accept me when judgment day arrives, when Jesus comes back, when he separates the sheep from the goats? Will he accept me, right? When he sees me for who I really am, when he knows what I think and the things that say and and all the things that I've done, will Jesus really accept me? And the answer to that question and that doubt is found in the fishing boat that we see of John chapter 21, verse 2. Look Look with me again says this, John 21, verse 2, It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, and the sons of Zebedee, known as James and John, are in the boat. So we're going to, like, fly through this. Okay, are you ready? We're going to look in that boat just a little bit more detailed this morning. Matthew 26 is one place I want to look. Matthew 26, starting at verse 69. This, this is what this says. Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. She said, you also were with Jesus of Galilee, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And this is, this is after Jesus has been arrested. And he's heading towards his crucifixion and all the trials that happened before that. Peter's hanging out, and this girl comes along and says, hey, I recognize you. You've been with Jesus. And he says, no, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Verse 71. Then Peter went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, This guy, this fellow, was with Jesus of Nazareth. And Peter said, I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely, surely, you're one of them for your accent. The way you talk, it gives it away. I know you've been with Jesus. And Peter began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. I don't know Jesus. Who's in the boat? Peter. The guy, when he's actually questioned about his connection with Jesus, says, I don't know anything about him. I don't want anything to do with him. I don't know him. There's another guy in the boat. Second on the list is this guy named Thomas. We get to learn about Thomas in John chapter 20, verses 24 and 25. Thomas One of the twelve apostles was not with the disciples when Jesus resurrected and appeared to them. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. 
But Thomas said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Who's in the boat? Thomas, this guy that we've labeled as a doubter. Why? Because he says, I will not believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead unless with my own hands and with my own eyes I get to see and touch the wounds in his hands and feet and side. I'm not going to believe. Who's in the boat? Thomas. There's another guy in that boat. Third on the list is a guy named Nathaniel. We learn a little bit about Nathaniel in John chapter 1. John chapter 1 verse 44 says this, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael says, Nazareth? A little fun this morning. You guys are have a little fun. Some of you are falling asleep. It's time to wake up. I want you to a little audience participation here to test that out to see how you'll really do. On the count of three, I just want you to out loud shout your first name. That's all you got to do. Does everybody know what that is? Okay, let's try it. Here we go. One, two, three. Mitchell. Nice. You're way better at that than first service. They're like, nah, nah. They They were still asleep. Okay, so... You, you, you passed that test. Now, here's what I want you to do. Um, think about the hometown in which you came from. Like uh, the town that maybe you grew up in when you were, let's say, adolescent age, you know, elementary, middle school. The town that you kind of grew up in, have your roots set in. And on the count of three, I just want you to shout the name of that town out loud. Can you handle that? Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Bland. Nice. I love that you guys are from I'm from a town called Bland. Let that set in for a second. That is just as exciting as the town is, Bland. And uh, I actually grew up in a, a, my teenage years from the Bland Christian Church. When we went to youth conferences, people were like, you're from where? <laughs> yeah, the Bland Christian Church. Anyway, so uh, Bland, very boring and uh, Nathaniel, he hears about this guy named Jesus, and, and these guys say he's from Nazareth, and Nathaniel says, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? And what I want you to know there is that Nathaniel's got some, some deep prejudice against this town named Nazareth. It's like white trash, redneck hillbilly people from there. And Nathaniel says, the Messiah, he can't be from Nazareth. Nothing good can come from there. Who's in the boat? Nathaniel, the guy that labeled Jesus as worthless the first time he ever even heard of him. There are two other guys in the boat. Their stories are probably told perhaps better than most of the other apostles. But they are the sons of Zebedee. Their first names were James and John. Luke chapter 9 tells a little bit about them. Luke 9 verse 51 says this, As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, so within the last few months of his earthly life, the time was approaching for his death, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. So these other people in these these villages, they had uh, some some pretty deep-rooted racism issues with the Jews from Jerusalem. And since Jesus was a Jew and he was on his way to Jerusalem, they really didn't like him. They didn't welcome him. Verse 54, when the disciples James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who are in the boat... When James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? It's like my favorite question in the Gospels. What? Where on earth do they even get this idea? They're like, Jesus, these guys don't like you. Let's kill them. You want us to do it? We'll do it. We'll do it right now. Just let us. Tell us. Give us the word. And Jesus is, have you guys missed Everything that I've been talking about for the past couple years. But Jesus turned and rebuked them and they went to another village. These guys, they've been with Jesus and they just don't get it. 
the sons of Zebedee. There's another spot in Matthew, and this one is just embarrassing as all get out. Matthew 20, starting at verse 20. It says, the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus. So this is James and John, their mom. She goes to Jesus, and it says she kneels down. So she's on her knees, and she says, I have a favor, Jesus. Will you grant me, will you grant me my wish? And he says, what is it you want? And she said, So my two boys, James and John, will you grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom? These grown men who have previously denounced judgment on this whole group of people wanting to call fire down from heaven and kill them now have their mommy come asking Jesus if they can be his best friends. Who's in the boat? James and John. That's just absurd. These five guys that this mentions, Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, James, John, they're all collectively the biggest bunch of losers you could ever meet in your life. They are bummer sheep. They're just ridiculous, making mistakes over and over again. And the thing about them is that they've been with Jesus through the whole thing. They've seen him heal. They've seen him cast out demons. They've seen him walk on water, turn water into wine, do all this amazing stuff. And still they're making dumb decision after dumb decision. And they're in the boat. Let me ask you, does that make you feel better about yourself? Yes, it does. Can I get an amen for that? Yeah. You know what we just did? Compared ourselves. Ouch, I set you up for that. Bummer sheep. The emphasis is never on them. You notice that? Never on them. It's always on Jesus. The emphasis is never on how much they mess up. It's always on How much Jesus forgives. Our goal should not be to sit back and compare ourselves to each other or to compare ourselves to them and their boneheaded mistakes or to even compare ourselves to other churches. And we're we're really good at that as church people sometimes. The goal is to just get in the boat. To jump on board with Jesus and watch what he can do. You see this boat... It doesn't give these guys or it doesn't give us permission to keep on making really bad decisions. Rather, getting in the boat with Jesus calls its inhabitants, it calls the people in the boat up to something better. It took time, a lot of time, for the apostles to get that. And I believe it takes us a lot of time too. Anybody have a really thick head up in here? I'm just looking for names to write down so I know later. And the rest of you are so thick-headed that you won't even raise your hand. You didn't know you are coming to church to be called a loser and a bummer sheep and thick-headed today, did you? So Jesus calls these guys into the boat and they jump in the boat with him and they continue to make really bad decisions. And then as he's getting ready to leave this world, he throws a few things out there. Matthew 28 is one of those. Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20, we call that the Great Commission. And Jesus says, this is just before he leaves, he says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. So, this is like Jesus' mission statement for his church. Do this. Go and make disciples. And I want you to pay really close attention to the order of things. That's my favorite part about the Great Commission, is the way that Jesus orders this. He says, I want you to go and make disciples. Now, don't ask questions. Just go and make people followers of me. Now, you can't force them to do that, but when they understand the message and they understand the forgiveness and the acceptance that comes through knowing Christ, then, yeah, some of them will bite and chew and some of them won't, and then you just move on, right? 
So go and make disciples of all nations, and the way you do that is baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then what does he say to do? Teach. You see, church, we mess this up a lot. And as people, we mess this up a lot because sometimes we think we have to have everything in order in our lives before we can ever even make the decision to follow Jesus. And that's just backwards. How in the world will we ever straighten up our lives if we don't have the help of Jesus and his Holy Spirit? And so this great commission says, come on in, be my disciple. I'm going to baptize you, or my people are going to baptize you, and then they will teach you everything that you need to know about following Jesus that is found in this. And after he said that, Acts chapter 1 is kind of his parting thing here. Check out what this says. Acts 1 verse 9. After he had said this, lots of, lots of things he said for his parting uh, ascension into heaven. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Now, if you're in their shoes, I'm guessing you're doing exactly what they're doing. Right? Jesus is hanging out with you. You know that he's about to leave. You don't know what that looks like. And then suddenly he just floats into the sky. And he disappears behind the clouds. I'm going to be doing the same exact things that these guys are doing, which is just. And I. I don't know how long it took. So I'm just going to hang out like this for a little bit. We got time. It's just jaw drop moment, right? And at the end of that, these two guys, angels, say this, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? You got stuff to do! That's kind of what they're saying. You have things to do. Jesus has given you that great commission. Now go do that instead of standing there staring at the sky, hoping he's going to return right now because he's not. He will someday. But until he does, get busy doing that stuff right there. And this is how his story ends. Mark chapter 16, verses 19 and 20. They say this. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then, then the disciples, the rest of the, his story, went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Jesus established his church to mobilize troops. Remember that ship? It was built that $80 million was spent on. It was changed, converted into a beacon of comfort and luxury that only a few could afford. Just like the SS United States, we will find ourselves wasting away. We will find ourselves dilapidated. We will find ourselves ruined if we ever begin comparing ourselves to others. This is the last thing I want to say about his story. Get in the boat with Jesus. I don't know where you're at with him right now. I don't know if you've made the decision to follow him or not. If you haven't, we highly encourage you to do that. Ask some questions. Make today the day that you get in the boat. If you've been looking for a church home and don't really know, hey, do I go here, do I belong here, do I not? We certainly invite you to get in the boat with us as we attempt to follow Jesus. Get in the boat with Jesus. And continue to getting to know him better than you ever have before. God, we love you. We thank you for the way that you've invited us into the boat. And uh, as we look at our lives, wow, we, uh, we compare really well to the boneheaded mistakes that some of those who have gone before us have made. But we know that when we start comparing, when we start looking around, the truth is we're just covering something up. Sometimes we lack assurance or confidence because we're not 100% sure if you're going to accept us. And so we go around trying to prove that to ourselves by looking and comparing ourselves to others when really the only one we need to trust is you. You will accept us as big of a bummer sheep as we can possibly be. You allow us to get in the boat with you and you call us up in that moment to something higher, something better.
something more. God, I pray today that uh, each of us will understand that our value doesn't come from anything that we're able to do on our own. Our value comes through knowing you and being your son or your daughter. And so today my prayer is that if there are those here contemplating making a decision to follow you, that they'll stop kicking it around and they'll just get in the boat and follow you. And my prayer also is those of us who have already made the decision to follow you, that we never attempt to make our lives comfortable and luxurious, but instead understand that we, we are a troop in the army of God. We have things to do. Instead of standing around with our jaws on the floor, we have things to do. We love you and thank you for your patience and your faithfulness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us. Amen. A few things going on today in this coming week we want to tell you about. First of all, uh, as you exit the uh, auditorium on the right, there is a table with a bunch of sign-up sheets for Vacation Bible School because that is unbelievably right around the corner. So if you'd like to help out this year with VBS in any capacity, there are all kinds of ways to get involved doing that. And also if you'd like to order a t-shirt for yourself, uh, we encourage you to do that as well. Um, also, if you can't smell it, once those doors open, you smell that? That's mm. Mexican food and that is good stuff. And so there's a youth meal right now out in the fellow or, uh, Family Life Center. Um, if you'd like to stick around that youth meal, all those proceeds go to sending our middle school and high school students on their various trips throughout the year. So we stick at, and encourage you to stick around for that. Um, also, next Sunday, May 5th, is Senior Day or Senior Sunday. 
uh, which means we will be honoring and recognizing uh, the high school seniors who are graduating from high school this year. Uh, and there will be some special things going on, but specifically a meal after second service next week. The church is providing the meat, but the rest of us are carrying in stuff. So if you'd like, if you'd like to bring your own dish or 603 to share, that would be great. Stick around, honor our seniors. I believe that is it. You have a wonderful week. Let's pray. We'll get it here. God, we thank you. Uh, we praise you, and uh, we are just uh, elated to be your people and to be a part of your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear, show your mighty hand, fill our streets and land, set your church on fire, win this nation back, change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Go be on fire for Jesus this week. Have a blessed week.